Thank you. Now we will turn to the floor. Uh, Professor Victor Savage, please try to ask the question. Please stand up, Victor. Please uh, try to uh, pose a question to one panellist and not all six panellists because we want to get one to reply. So uh, take the microphone, please. Is there a hand over there too? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question deals with a broader issue. One of the great uh, drivers today of national development and urban development is capitalism and all its uh, you know, relationships in terms of materialism, consumerism, and the fetish for growth. The question here obviously is that we can have sustainable cities in, in this kind of economic system. I mean, there's so much literature on this, and very few of the panelists across all the sessions have tried to address the issue of the massive ecological footprint that cities are leaving behind in the world. And studies have shown, WWF has shown that currently we need 1.2 worlds, resources of 1.2 worlds, to be able to support the quality of life we have. In 2050, it's going to be two worlds. A recent study in Nature showed that there are three areas in which the breakdown of natural systems has happened. One is climate change, two is biodiversity, and three is the nitrogen cycle, which is a result of basically uh, agricultural stresses and strains. So the question here is that, as Gandhi said, you know, we, the world has enough for every man's needs, but not enough for every man's greed. So the question I want to pose to you is that, how can we make cities more sustainable in terms of a greater relationship with our hinterlands, so that we don't leave behind massive ecological footprints that is going to muck up the whole uh, global environment? That's a pertinent question that has not been addressed by anybody. No, please address it to one or two panellists. Choose two well, panellists. The person from Shell, maybe? Shell, okay. And, and the other person here? Conrad. Uh, okay. okay. So these two will answer the question. Just, if you don't mind, I want to take one more question. I see a hand over there. Please stand up and identify yourself and pose the question. Yeah. I'm uh, Sujata from Hong Kong, a planner and urban designer. I have a question about, like, in urbanization and like countries and cities are getting richer but the uh, income divide social equity is all the gap is also becoming larger and i think uh, cities and urbanization would have solved problems only if poverty and slum uh, are have been solved also and what would be uh, a way forward for a lot of like say slums in uh, some of the Indian cities. I know Singapore solved its slums problem, but I think on a country level, it's a lot uh, more. And then the other uh, thing is about public space. Humanizing cities, I think, is very important, as we've seen from uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, how would other cities look for that? Because if you look at cities today, you see more and more cars. Yeah. That means we are designing for more cars. Yeah. How would you revert that back to cities for people? Okay, so maybe inequality issue are you take and public spaces, why don't I pose to um, Buenos Aires and Beijing, the question of public spaces, and then I'll come to you later, Bruno. So Jeremy, you start first. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a very pertinent question, thank you for that, and I'll respond to it by making two points, really. Uh, first of all, uh, you're right, uh, when we talk about the stress nexus, it's because we recognize that these pressures are very intense and are growing. We also recognize that we have choices. We can make collective choices. Traffic and transportation has come up a number of times. Uh, we've studied uh, the uh, about 600 cities in the world with a population above 700,000. Uh, and when we look at traffic and mobility, you, know, you see major differences. So for example, the average US citizen uses three times as much energy for personal transportation as the average European. Part of it is because of choices around vehicles, vehicle size, but actually they travel twice as far. And they travel twice as far because of the way that cities have developed. Uh, they have developed in a sprawling manner with poor public transportation. That was locked in 
decades and decades ago. So we have choices about the way that we now develop our cities. Uh, do we develop them in compact ways with smart integrated infrastructure and smart mobility? and the technology investments that go along with that. So we do have choices, but they're in our hands now, and if we make the wrong ones now, we lock in for 30, 40, 50 years. Just secondly, on the city's agenda, it's come up here a couple of times, very good examples of what I call the blueprints dynamic. Uh, we talked about the cities as a focus for climate action. We talked about uh, the uh, organizations connecting cities like uh, ICLIA. These are good things. However, they are not happening fast enough. The pressures are outstripping what we are doing collectively. So if cities are a focus, I say to cities, seize the day. I almost swore there, seize the day. You, know, you are part of policy making. We as industry, we are the muscles of society. We move things along, we make things happen, but the brain collectively is the authorities that shape the frameworks. So we have to work together in public-private partnership and we have to work on these integrated issues together. So for goodness sake, don't be complacent because the world is currently moving much slower than that blueprints outlook, which is a great concern for me as a father and grandfather. Thank you. I, I see you didn't answer the question whether we should get rid of capitalism. <laughs> yes Look, or no, that's all. Just in, yes in or no. In 30 seconds, it's difficult. Sorry? In 30 seconds, it's difficult. <laughs> I know. Okay, anyway, just, just, just trying to move on. Okay. Um, Conrad. Yeah. Yeah, the issue of cities' footprints is, of course, not the cities themselves, it's uh, the humans and, and the, the economy. Um, because uh, people flock into cities so that they have better living conditions and better access to, to uh, social services and so on and, and jobs, that's quite clear. Um, but with the density in cities that provides better conditions for eco-efficiency, this eco-efficiency factor and gain is being eaten up by urban lifestyle that is more resource uh, consumptive. And I think the, the problem is that uh, our economic growth is very much based on a higher material and energy throughput and shorter and shorter lifetime of, of, of things. Uh, in earlier centuries, people probably were, were having a piece of furniture that they would uh, inherit and they would give to their, to their kids. Nowadays, we have cars with a lifetime of 10 or 15 years, and many people change the car every two years or every three years. We have uh, gadgets like mobile phones, smartphones, that everybody wants to have a new one or needs a new one every two or three years. So we are driving the economy still into more uh, short-term uh, throughput of energy and materials. And as long as we can't, let's say, uh, uh, transform the economy in something which is based more on the end effect, we want to be healthy and happy, right? The healthy and happy communities. And, um, and to decouple it from the resource and energy throughput, then we'll, we'll not, not make it. So the question is, how do we uh, base our economy more on, again, on human labor, on services, rather than on material and energy in intensive things. And this is, I think, a task for each of us as individuals, but also for, for the companies have, of course, a problem when the whole existence of the company is based on, on producing these things of, that uh, have a short lifetime. So I don't have a solution for them, and I don't know whether anybody has a solution. National governments don't dare to regulate, so maybe some crisis will have to, to lead to collapses in this or that area in the next decades. Uh, but I think uh, we have just to be conscious of the fact and in, in the uh, framework of what we can decide individually or as a mayor or in our respective um, 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 uh, environments, we have to just be conscious of the need for dematerialization uh, of, of our economy. Okay, Isha, quickly on, on social, on in inequality, on, 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 rising on inequality. I what do we do? On, on slums, a question has been asked and that's very important. Slums are not just the result of poverty. Slums are the result of a dysfunctional housing market, particularly for low-income groups. So what we really need is planning, planning with public transport and low-income housing in mind. There are experiments in Vijaywada, 
you know, there is a new development in which they have reserved space where it is not that the state is providing uh, uh, social housing, but you create conditions in which uh, that can be done. And I'll just take two more uh, 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 seconds to say that India's need, I, mean, I have focused on public service delivery or, and infrastructure investment deficit. But India's need for urban space is such that we are going to have many more new cities. And it is extremely important that in building our new cities, we match spatial planning with where investments are going and that we cater to the needs for housing for all sections by catering, I don't mean providing, but create conditions in which housing comes up and public transport remains in the focus. So I think we have to start by giving examples in the new cities, both through green buildings and green planning, and then you know, with demonstration, more progressive cities will follow and slowly we will see the effect. Thank you. Now, Mauricio and Mr. Joe about uh, public spaces. Well, uh, what you need, lady, is a political decision. And you have so many ex failure experiences. Mexico City innovated with a second floor highway. It lasts like, I don't know, if it was like less than one day and it was also collapsed. So there's no use, there's no solution for the cars. If more than you build, more than you get cars going into the cities. So the only solution in the first stage is public transportation. But the final solution is the opposite of what in the states had developed. We have to go to concentrated cities and people living near where they work. So they, have, they, they can go to work in terms of walking distance, bicycle distance. This is the final solution if the work continues to, to concentrate the population in the cities. In a, just a joke, but I've heard in another summit that one of the principal, <coughs> uh, the principal causes of this concentration in the, in the big cities is the Viagra. Mm -hmm. Is what? The Viagra, do you know Viagra? This, the, that pill for sex, that is the, the, principal, oh, okay. the principal cause of this concentration. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Joe. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, in Beijing, although the rate of urbanization is very quick, but we are still quite doing quite well in terms of our industrial makeup. Our tertiary industry is now about 75% and our primary industry is about 5%. Our secondary industry is also changing. Therefore, as a political center, as a capital of a country, Beijing is very consciously trying to uh, control the secondary industry or the manufacturing industry in terms of the impact it brings. And in that case, we will see our uh, employment or our job opportunities being more high-end, and our employment makeup will also be more diverse. And from that point of view, I think that the overall uh, control that we have on our vehicular growth is still within uh, some limits. So I think the priority here is still in terms of economic development and uh, advancement. For those who want to have their own cars, for those who really feel strongly about having their own cars, we do not uh, do not prevent them from get, getting their cars, but we do have regulations in place. And especially during peak hours, in the, the early hours and after office hours, we, have, we need to have regulations and measures in place to uh, prevent the, the congestion problems from getting worse. And the, tube, uh, the subway system is something that we're also working on. And we are, as I said, we're trying to build like 1,000 kilometers of uh, subway tracks in time to come. And I think that is something that we are looking at. And Beijing is also a, an example for other cities to follow in China. And we hope that uh, within the next few years, we can have um, more measures in place. 
And in terms of waste management, we also um, have some progress in this area. We have about 2,000 to 3,000 fully automated cars to deal with this problem. And so from t a technological point of view, from an economic point of view, and from several other points of view, we are trying to have a multi-pronged approach to deal with this problem. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We, we are running out of time. Bruno, you have a quick point to make on any other issues? Yes, I think the, um, uh, what I like is the examples. And, uh, uh, you know, I think the, uh, one of the targets in the city of Singapore is that 75% uh, of um, traffic at peak hours would be done on public transport. I think that's a sort of indicator that, you know, cities need to be sort of looking at the point about public, um, uh, public space. Um, very glad that New York was uh, uh, w winning the prize because what um, has been done in terms of public, place in, uh, public space in New York is fantastic in terms of recreating, you know, these um, um, elements of, um, of community, um, a safe environment. And no one would have said 10 years ago that uh, New York was the easiest environment to, uh, to actually do that. On the point of informal communities, what's happening in, um, in Soweto, what's happening in Brasilia in terms of electrification of the, uh, the favelas, in terms of um, a transfer of ownership to uh, facilitate, uh, create fluidity uh, within uh, the, uh, the townships to, uh, to be able to exchange and therefore to build our element of the, uh, the solution. But just one word on, on that point about, you know, are cities the problem or the solution? The, the philosophy is that cities can be more sustainable in the kind of uh, um, environment we're in um, if we make all the efforts that are required. But the density, uh, the concentration, um, the, the common facilities, uh, the common access, all the link also with the way we, um, we create wells, develop education, this is where cities are incredibly attractive. And so uh, I would not start from cities are the problem, would say, you know, let's figure out, therefore, how they can be a better solution because they have to be part of the solution. I see one hand down there. We can quickly ask, we are out of time, but ask a very quick question if you don't mind. Please stand up, give the microphone to the gentleman. Yeah. And if you don't mind, very short, sharp, brisk question. The urbanization uh, today is about uh, two persons per second. That means it's about 175,000 a day five million a month, 50, 50 to 60 million a year. About a half, one third of that urbanization is informal. All these planned cities, or many of the planned cities have this informal, but we are talking about whether urban, whether rural poor are moving into to the cities and become urban poorer. In the planned cities, like Singapore, about 5% of the land is used for public, public services, for, for transport, for, for parks and like that. In these informal parts, it's about 10%. How can we prevent that this growing informal urbanization is taking place in the way that it's almost impossible to make the solutions in, in the coming years? Can we find a way between the planned city and this unplanned informal part? How can we reserve areas so we get it, have a possibility to have an urban transportation, to have water sanitation and things like that? We are talking about that, that something is there and then we are planning the rest. We must find something intermediate, otherwise we can't help people when we are talking about the eradication of the poverty and things like that. Can you just identify yourself, if you don't mind? I'm in Maria, but I'm the mayor of the city of Malmö. Okay, thank you. Now, I tell you what, you know, we are out of time, but why don't I give each and every one of you one minute at the conclusion. And in that one minute, in response to this statistics about the rapid urbanization, tell the audience, as you look ahead over the next 20 years, one, do you feel optimistic or pessimistic about cities, and why? in one minute or less. So, Jeremy, quickly. Uh, yes, I feel optimistic and pessimistic because we can make different choices. And uh, you're on the point that was made earlier just then, I mean, Malmo is a great example of redevelopment in, in a city. When you have a good city, you will attract more people. That can be a great benefit, but also it can bring these pressures. So, in your planning of cities, 
be time-oriented and think ahead. So just as with the London sewer system in Victorian times, which was massively oversized for the needs of the day, uh, there was investment in infrastructure that recognized that there was going to be growing pressures well beyond what was envisaged. So if we can get this time-oriented issue in our minds, along with transport-oriented development and the use of uh, cleaner fuels like natural gas rather than coal uh, and better water and waste management, we can handle these issues. But we have to make choices now, otherwise we'll be locked in for 50 years. Thank you. Bruno, one minute or less. One minute less. So, uh, um, from, um, from a city standpoint, the first thing is you have to define your Sorry, promise. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? I'm always optimistic. It's Pessimist too late to no optimistic. It's too late to be pessimistic anyway. So, no. The first thing is you know you need a promise, and I think we heard some examples of a promise. What what the city is all about. Uh, we need leadership, and I, you know I really loved what uh, Mauricio was said um, was saying in the introduction. We need to to be in a world of collaboration more and more, and particularly this idea of you know public private collaboration and platforms. We need to redefine this concept of value, what uh, the value of a city is all about, because uh, it's not necessarily going to be classic sort of um, economic models. I believe that leveraging technology is part of the solution, and it's not sufficiently done, and it's not you know um, technology for technology, but it's really about new uh, new business model. I believe it's a, a different ways of working. Um, collaboration requires different model of procurement, uh, requires a different model of contracting. Typically, performance contracting should be imposed to, um, to in all cities for um, any public uh, building. And finally, it's all about, about change, because it cannot happen if the citizen is not part of that. And you know, the link to the informal community is that they don't ask to be part of the planning. So one, you need to address your sort of normal citizenship. But for informal community, you need to find ways to create that sort of great transition I was trying to describe for uh, South Africa and Brazil. But yes, we need to remain optimistic. Thank you. Isha, optimistic or pessimistic? Absolutely optimistic. optimistic. No question about that. Now, let me address uh, the question of uh, expanding at the periphery and informal settlements. I would um, urge you to look at the town planning schemes which Gujarat has used in Ahmedabad to plan as a city expands on the fringes. That's one. Second, we need flexible work models, now that we have IT, now that we can have offices at home, now that we can give more room to women because they can combine work with family. And believe me, I'm a mainstream economist who has turned to city and urban development studies only in the last five years. And I'm convinced that if women are if there are more women in positions of power, you will see better planning of cities, you will see better <laughs> public service delivery, so more power to women. <laughs> okay, Mauricio, sorry. We have to replace you with the women, Mauricio. <laughs> okay. Uh, as I'm with my wife, I fully agree with you. <laughs> no, but uh, I am optimistic. I think that humans have discovered that nothing better to live with the other humans. So concentration will continue. New generations have a full compromise with the, with the environment. And the challenge is solving the new problems, working in a team, private sector, and political governments. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Joe, optimistic or pessimistic? And what's your forecast in one minute or less? Optimistic. As our Chairman Mao has once said, the future is bright, the road is long. So in Beijing, I think, first of all, we have to understand that we are trying to do the best for the majority of the population. We're doing it for their best interests. That's our main consideration. And then we also have to make Beijing a truly livable city. And thirdly, we must use innovative ways to use technology, to use cutting-edge technology to achieve our purposes and to improve our management system as well as our policies. I think in that way, 
the future of Beijing will be a brighter one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joe. Conrad, quickly, optimistic, pessimistic. I'm Pessimistic when I look at the ability or inability. Okay. <laughs> no, sorry, uh, inability of governments to act on, on what the world needs. I am optimistic that yes, women, because men are the major part of the problem of our civilization. <laughs> I could explain it. I have, don't have the time for it. But we are looking at, at all the gadgets. We are we, are, we fall in love with technology and so on, rather to go back to the normal things of life and and and, and do what's reasonable. So anyway, um, we need youth. To, to, to take charge of their own fate because we are messing up their future opportunities. And um, so if we have an, uh, it would come to a very unusual coalition of cities as major actors where most of the people are living with the positive and promising parts of, of business that provide the solutions, women as ma basic drivers towards reasonable and rational uh, solutions and ways of life, and youth as the ones that have the legitimate right to determine how they actually want to live, then I think we can make it. Let me, let me end with a personal confession. When the organizers uh, asked me to chair this panel with five speakers in 90 minutes, I said impossible. You will never get a good discussion in, among so many panelists in such a short space of time, I'm glad that I've been proven wrong. That this has been a truly outstanding panel because what's remarkable is that as you look at the urbanization challenges over the next 20 years, which is our topic, in this very short space of time, our panelists managed to raise all the fundamental questions that need to be addressed. We may not have found the answers, but we succeeded in raising the right questions, starting with Mauricio saying, what is happiness? Why do you want more? Why do you have to keep accumulating? Why do you have to have a piece of furniture created every two, three years rather than inherited from your parents? So I think we do need, at the present stage of global development in all the cities, to start asking fundamental questions all over again, and in that sense, I think this panel has made an enormous contribution. So now please join me in thanking them. <laughs>